everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for participating in the CJS uh, webinar today. I am Keiko Yamanaka, continuing lecturer at the Ethnic Studies UC Berkeley. Today, I serve as a moderator of the event, uh, but before I introduce the speakers, I would like to make a statement that acknowledges UC Berkeley's Ohlone land occupation. Today, I am speaking from the campus of the University of California, Berkeley. Before starting the event, I would like to announce that I recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Velona Bund of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to uh, Muwekama Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of Velona Bund. I recognize that a Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. Now, let me turn uh, briefly to the immigration workshop series that a CJS started in February this year. It is intended uh, to bring some of the key concerns and the challenges that a Japan faces regarding immigration to the attention of the CJS audience. I am the organizer of the series and I serve as the moderator of each workshop. Today's event is the third of the series and will address Japan's population changes and social mobility of immigrant workers. The next workshop, which is scheduled on November 15th, will discuss Japan's aging society and immigrant nurses who play increasingly important roles in taking care of Japanese senior citizens. Its website will be available very soon for your views. Uh, now, long due, let me introduce the speaker of the day and a discussion to his lecture. It is my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished scholar on Japan's population changes and social changes that result from large demographic movements. Dr. Yu Korekawa is currently the director of the Department of International Research and Cooperation of the National Institute of Population and Social Security Research and has overseen international migration and migration policy research, publishing many articles in both English and Japanese. In this seminar, he will give a talk titled What does matter beyond the cultural explanation of the immigration society uh, of Japan or immigrant society of Japan. He will speak for about 45 minutes, which will be followed by the comments by Professor Kazuo Yamaguchi, Ralph Lewis professor at the Department of Sociology, University of Chicago. Then the floor will be open for the questions from the audience. When you have a quest, uh, question, please write uh, in Q and M menu uh, below the screen, not the uh, chat uh, menu. Okay, Dr. Korekawa, the podium is open, all open for you. Oh, oh sorry, I was muted. Okay. So thank you for introducing me. Uh, by uh, Dr. Yamanaka or Keiko Yamanaka. And uh, uh, today I'd like to have a, a talk on uh, immigra immigra Immigrant Society of Japan by uh, using uh, uh, demographic data and uh, uh, some uh, global trend. Uh, so, okay, so let's start uh, lecture. Okay, so I share my presentation. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, it's my honor to be able to have a lecture today. And my uh, 
title of uh, title of my presentation is uh, what does matter uh, beyond uh, the cultural explanation of immigrant society of japan uh today uh, this uh so my presentation will will focus on uh, the kind of uh, social economic aspect of uh in incorporation of uh, immigrant in japan not from the cultural uh, perspective so it's a relatively new perspective probably for many uh, migrant researchers in japan and of course in the us so okay uh, let's start to let's move to the uh, events and so there are four topics today so first of all the global trend so i'd like to show a global trend and uh Japanese uh, Japan's position in it and second topic is Japan as an uh, emerging destination so last about uh, 30 years uh, Japan is changing into a uh, country of immigration rapidly so I'd like to show uh, some aspects of the change uh, by some data set and third topic is uh, the core of today's presentation so labor market integration of migrants in Japan uh, I'd like to show the uh, situation of uh, integration of migrants in Japan by using uh, census data, mic micro data of the census. Uh, it's a, a new uh, approach uh, to uh, integration of migrants in Japan. And fourth is a conclusion. So what does matter in the integration of migrants in Japan? I'd like to show a new perspective uh, in this regard. Okay. Okay, so uh, the global trend. Okay, so according to the famous textbook on continental migration, there are four phases uh, after World War II uh, regarding the global trend of international migration. So phase one is it start it's it started from 1945 to 93. So from the end of World War II to the first oil crisis, uh, it's a very famous period, famous uh, phase uh, known as uh, uh, accepting many guest workers to uh, Western European countries. And phase two is uh, from 1973 uh, to 89, from the oil crisis to the end of the Cold War. So this phase is a relatively uh, kind of a, a moderate uh, phase of uh, international migration and phase three starts from uh, the end of the cold war to the global uh, financial crisis in 2008 so it's an era of globalization and many uh, former immigration countries changed into countries of immigration in this phase during this phase japan is also the case of the uh, migration transition during this phase and phase four is uh is it's a, a kind of a backlash to phase three so expansion and deepening of international human mobility and its repercussions uh typically you you can see that uh, brexit and uh, uh yeah and uh trump presidency in 2016 um, and many other european countries are uh, changed into uh, the cabinet of kind of right wing party led by right wing party uh, during this phase and phase if we have a phase five uh, it's a, a kind of after the uh, pandemic so we are now at the verge of the phase five okay so next is uh, it's a global trend uh, showing the uh, migration trend between continents and uh, intra-regional area movements. Uh, first of all, you can see that uh, GCC countries, so Gulf Cooperation Council countries, uh, such as Saudi Arabia, UAE, uh, Kuwait, something like that, uh, accepting uh, you know, a great number of uh, migrants uh, from Asia. So you can see that the figures, so, uh, for example, from South Asia to GCC countries, the number is larger than the uh, total number of migrants uh, going from Asia to North America. So GCC countries are the biggest recipient countries uh, in international migration. And uh, in terms of the internal 
uh, migration. So uh, Europe, so within the Schengen area of EU, uh, shows a uh, uh, very huge number of internal mi migration. And it is also case of Asia. Asia shows uh, this large figure, which is larger than that of Europe. So from those uh, figures, you can see that Asia, Asia is the most prominent hotspot of international migration. And GCC countries uh, are the largest ones. Okay, so we can move to, we can focus on uh, Asia uh, migration more, in more detail. Uh, from, from Asia, uh, about 7 million migrants are dispatching uh, leaving their countries, uh, working for abroad, uh, working abroad, and uh, uh, about one third are going to GCC countries. So about 2.4 million migrants are going to GCC countries for work every year. It's a fraud data. And uh, rest of one third uh, go to OECD countries, so advanced economies. So it's about 2 million. And among OECD member states, Japan is a, a top recipient of uh, labor migrants from Asia. It's about uh, 400,000 per year, which is larger than that of uh, Korea and to US. And uh, less of uh, one, one third uh, go to ASEAN and other Asian countries. So it's about uh, 2.5 million every year. So from these figures, uh, Japan is the largest recipient country uh, moving to uh, advanced economies from Asia. Okay, so so next question is how does the model migration differ from uh, those in the US and Europe? So Asia is the uh, uh, largest recipient countries of international migration, but there's a big difference in terms of modes of migration between US and Europe and Asia. So uh, there are four characteristics. So first one is uh, more business than family uh, humanitarian migrants. Uh, so in Asia, um, many migrants are contract-based and are co contract-based and temporary workers. Uh, so uh, they, in many cases, so they are business-oriented. And second characteristics, is uh, more short-term temporary than long-term permanent migrants. As I mentioned, so they uh, go abroad for work just uh, for a limited term. So uh, they tend to be short-term and temporary migrants. And as a result, uh, sending countries and migrants themselves are weighted more toward economics than human rights. So they yeah, tend to seek uh, economic benefits than uh, yeah, being, pro in, being pro protected in terms of human rights. So uh, it's a, uh, in many cases, it causes some kind of gaps between uh, kind of human rights oriented people and uh, migrants uh, and sending countries. And force is more systematic than indiv individualistic. So in US and Europe, many migrants uh, individual base. So many uh, decision uh, was made by uh, individual themselves or family. Uh, but uh, in Asia, uh, in many cases, uh, many business intermediates are playing an important role and uh, sending uh, many people uh, systematic. So it's a big difference between uh, Asia and other parts of the world. Okay. Uh, I show this uh, structure by this uh, figure. And first, so Asian people usually choose to migrate for work in their life, uh, where uh, the migratory process depends on their socioeconomic status. So as you can see, so education is very important factor uh, to decide which country you will migrate. So. Uh, among tertiary educated people, main routes are, are international study abroad, in abroad. So you can uh, go to, uh, in many cases, you go to language schools, universities in other countries, 
And after, the, after graduation, they uh, will obtain a job in distinction country. But this layer is very thin, so number is very small. And the vast majority of them are compulsory, compulsory educated people. They move to uh, mainly GCC countries as those skilled workers and uh, made uh, in the uh, household. <clears throat> and our secondary educated people are growing part of the mi migrants from Asia. So growing parts of uh, migrants from Asia. So their migratory process are overlapped uh, of that of compulsory educated people, but uh, they move to they uh, they mainly move to teach technical in technical intern and trainee program and spe specified skilled worker program in Japan or uh, employment permission system in Korea. So they those are uh, because those are middle skilled worker system. So uh, this is a growing part of uh, migration from Asia to other countries. Okay, and so most migration is contract-based and temporary. So as for uh, secondary and compulsory educated people, uh, they are mainly uh, contract-based and temporary. And third, uh, various intermediates play an essential role in forming the migratory process. So you can see that uh, there are many intermediates uh, from private agencies, brokers, and official sending organizations uh, established by sending countries' government. So, uh, as I mentioned, governments usually have sections specialized in sending the national, nationals abroad. And the official sending organizations deal with uh, the sending services. Okay. And uh, fifth, uh, migrants and the governments uh, place more uh, weight on economic benefits than human rights. So as I mentioned in the previous slide. Okay. So in the backdrop of it, uh, it's a, a basic structure. So it's a new, a relatively new uh, theory on international migration called uh, aspiration uh, and capability uh, model. So uh, this model uh, argued that economic growth would accelerate immigration from a country along with the rise of migration aspirations and capabilities. So it's contradictory to the simple uh, push-pull model, so gap model between two countries. So uh, it's a uh, little, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but uh, it's a, uh, situation this theory argued. According, uh, actually, according to the latest IMF study, the pressure to send migrants uh, decreases when a GDP per capita reaches 2,000 US dollars, but migration to high income countries increases up to uh, 7,000 US dollars. So uh, mig migration from Asia is more susceptible to economic growth as I mentioned, they are mainly contract-based, business-oriented migrants. So that's why uh, migration from Asia is more susceptible to this uh, structure, this model. And uh, we can also say that economic growth in Asia will increase migration abroad. OK, uh, so you can see uh, the actual relationship between economic de development and migration to uh, each destination countries. So first of all, the higher the economic level of the sending country, the higher the percentage of migrants aiming for Japan and the US. So you can see this red line, these red lines showing the relationship between GDP per capita and the proportion to the total, uh, proportion to the total em immigrants to Japan and the US. So it's a positive relationship between those two uh, factors. Uh, however, in the case of Korea, when the economic level exceeds a certain level, migration begins to decrease. So it's a reversed U-shaped curve. So it increases at some, to some level, but after the peak, 
uh, it decreases again. And in the case of the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, so this figure, the number of migrants has declined as economic levels have risen. So it's a, a clear uh, adverse re relationship between economic development and migration to GCC countries. So, uh, so as a result, we can say that uh, rising economic levels uh, tend to increase the number of people moving to higher income countries, but show um, a very clear and sharp adverse relationship uh, migration in migration to GCC countries. Okay, uh, this is a global trend. So next is uh, the Japan as an emerging destination. Okay, so it's a uh, overall history of international migration of Japan since uh, 1875. So from the beginning of Meiji era. So at the, from the beginning of the modernization of Japan. <clears throat> Until 1945, Japan was a country of immigration due to its high population pressure so you can see this blue line uh, means our Japanese expatriates living abroad. And this black line means former colonial origin migrants, mainly ethnic Koreans now. And this red line means new common migrants, mainly uh, coming to Japan after uh, 1980s and 1990s. Okay, so about 2.6 million Japanese expatriates lived mainly in China uh, Korean Peninsula and Taiwan before World War II. So about uh, at the time of uh, 1940 or so, so uh, 2.6 million uh, was recorded. And on the other hand, about 1.3 million colonial origin migrants lived in the Japanese islands as of 1940. So uh, the last census before uh, the end of World War II. So it means uh, we uh, Japan was a country of immigration. But after 1945, Japan lost overseas colonies, Jap Japanese expatriates returned to the Japanese islands and colonial origin migrants returned to their uh, countries of origin. Of course, they went back and forth during this period, but uh, at the end, a number of colonial origin people living in Japan as of 1947 was uh, yeah, this number. So uh, five, 547,000 uh, people living in Japan. And the international migration was kept constantly low until the 1980s. So during this period, yeah, it was very uh, kept constantly low. But after the 1980s, due to the globalization of the economy, Japanese economy, many Japanese people went abroad as international students and intra-company transferees of Japanese companies. So you can see this red line uh, loads again after 1980. Uh, sorry, this blue line uh, lies again after 1980, and now it's about 1.3 million. And, the, and uh, in addition, the number of newcomer migrants is growing rapidly uh, after uh, 1990s. So after the Reform Act of uh, Immigration Control and Re Refugee Recognition Act. So uh, Japan experienced a migration transition in the 1990s. So it uh, took over the number of Japanese expatriates in 1993 or four and it skyrocketed to about 2.6 uh, million uh, as of 2021. So of course, it's just a 2.2% of the total population of Japan. But in terms of the absolute number, it's not small. OK, it's a composition of a country of origins of migrants, and uh, it's a region, and countries of uh, regions of uh, origin. Yeah, and uh, it's a countries of origin. So Chinese are the majority. And recently, uh, the number of Vietnamese people uh, growing rapidly after 2010. And uh, 
there are also uh, in Japanese Brazilians living in Japan, but their numbers uh, kept constant uh, during 2000s. Okay, and uh, mainly come from Asia, but yeah, as I mentioned, the number of Japanese Brazilians are not small in Japan. So South American people uh, occupy a certain amount of, yeah, part of the migrant population in Japan. Okay, it's a major policy development. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is a basic characteristics of uh, Japan as an imaginary destination. And in the backdrop of it, there are uh, kind of structure of uh, migration policy among uh, OEC member states. So we can uh, overview the uh, structure of migration policy uh, in uh, following slides. So this slide shows that the number of permanent migrants accepted per year by OECD member states. So Japan is 10th ranked in terms of acceptance of permanent migrants. And top is the US, so about 1 million permanent migrants accepted every year, just before a pandemic, just before the pandemic. And in terms of the composition, uh, actually, uh, many of them are family, humanitarian, and free movements. And uh, work-related migrants uh, just occupying 13%. Uh, if you include accompanying family workers, it's just 19% of the people migrants accepted by OEC member states. And this category, so work category is not a majority, and it's also not a rising part of permanent migrants. So as you can see that from 2008, work-related permanent migrants, a number of work-related permanent migrants declined uh, gradually until 2015. And after that, it uh, was recovered uh, slightly, but it's still a uh, very uh, minor uh, part uh, of uh, permanent migration. And this uh, slide also shows the uh, kind of uh, characteristics of migration policy among OECD member states. I categorize uh, four migration policies of four major uh, member states. And first of all, the United States shows a very distinguished pattern uh, of accepting fam family migrants. So it's a radar chart uh, showing the composition of uh, which category was uh, is accepted by each member states. And the US accepted uh, family migrants a lot. So its proportion is uh, higher than 60% of the total permanent migrants to the US. And Japan shows the very similar pattern to uh, that of Canada. So Canada and Japan uh, shows the uh, high percentage of work created uh, migrants uh, every year and a low family migration acceptance. Uh, and the only difference between Japan and Canada is uh, the acceptance of humanitarian migrants. So Japan uh, accepted, accepts very limited number of humanitarian migrants. So it's only a uh, difference. And as for uh, Germany, so Germany accepted a, a large number of free movement uh, within Schengen area. So many migrants to Germany, uh, mainly European people, not from South, country, uh, South countries. So um, their uh, pattern is very uh, unique compared to other uh, countries. Okay, so United States is dominated by family immigrants. And yeah, so as I mentioned, Japan and Canada is very, are very similar. So uh, we can say that Japan is positioned as a migration state with a policy of accepting mainly labor migrants. So it's a big difference between, uh, yeah, as you see that the average picture of uh, acceptance of permanent migrants among OEC member states. Okay, and, and, uh, Next slide. So this slide shows a temporary immigration. So uh, another side of the same coin. 
So permanent and temporary migration are playing an important role uh, in terms of migration policy. But in many, in many cases, uh, this uh, aspect is for, for, uh, forgot so, and skipped. So I'd like to shed light on uh, this kind of hidden aspect of uh, migration policy. So recently, the number of temporary immigration is rising. So total number is about 5 million, so almost the same number uh, of a permanent migration. So largest acceptance country is Poland, so mainly from Ukraine. So they, uh, accept, they accept Ukraine temporary workers uh, since 2014. So, uh, yeah, Russian uh, invasion to uh, Crimea Peninsula. And second largest uh, recipient country is the United States, and third is Germany, and Japan is uh, six, yeah, uh, ranked uh, in terms of acceptance of temporary immigration. And mainly temporary immigration are work-oriented uh, and work-related one. And in terms of the labor migrants received uh, per year, I classified, I ranked uh, countries according to the number of uh, labor migrants, uh, regardless of the, uh, their type, so permanent and temporary. And I, we found that Japan is now fifth ranked uh, in terms of acceptance of uh, labor migrants. And next uh, finding is that, uh, so this, column shows the uh, proportion of temporary migrants among labor migrants received. And Japan ha has show Japan shows uh, a second lowest percentage of temporary migrants among labor migrants uh, among uh, G7 countries, so uh, which is next to Canada. And another country uh, show higher percentage of uh, proportion of temporary migrants uh, among uh, total labor migrants. So it's uh, uh, counterintuitive, but uh, it's a reality. Okay, and as for uh, the prospect, uh, IMF projected migration pressure uh, until, two until 2013 and found that uh, migrants in advanced uh, economies will keep growing despite economic convergence between advanced economies and emerging and uh, developed economies. And as for the Japanese case, uh, JICA projected an outlook of labor migration towards Japan until 2014 under the conditions of uh, further economic development and demographic transition in Asia. So uh, which is almost the same assumptions uh, as uh, uh, that of IMF. And uh, this project, this projection found that migration flow uh, will be tripled, although the income level of Asian sending countries will also be tripled. And about uh, 3,500 US dollar is the threshold for the immigration rate in Asian countries, and 7,000 US dollar is the uh, threshold for Japan. So uh, those figures are almost says same as the figures uh, found in IMF report. And uh, in terms of the sending countries, China will be taken over by Vietnam in the uh, near future, uh, and Myanmar and uh, Philippines will follow. Okay, uh, this is uh, another estimation, uh, but uh, I, it's my trial estimation, uh, the ethnic diversity of Japan in 2065. Uh, and I assume very conservative uh, net migration number to Japan during the projection term. But I found that about 12% uh, of the total population of Japan uh, as of 2065 will have a, a migrant background. And uh, the, in the absolute term, it's more than 10 million. And uh, in terms of the age composition, so as of 2015, you can see that about 60% of younger generation already have a, a migrant background. 
But as of 2030, so just eight years later from now, uh, about 10% of young uh, generation have uh, uh, will have a migrant background. So uh, ethnic, ethnic diversity from the bottom is also the case of Japan. And in terms of the total population, Japan is now just a 2.6%. Uh, so it means a, a proportion of the people with migrant background. But in 2065, it will uh, rise to 12%, uh, almost the same level as Italy in 2015. But more important point is ethnic diversity from the bottom. I'd like to underscore uh, this figure. Okay, so uh, Japan as I mentioned distinction. So I can summarize uh, these five points. Uh, so, but most important point is uh, with the economic growth in Asia, Japan has become more of an aspire, aspire destination. So uh, it's a, a very important uh, yeah, background of the uh, presentation after this, these slides. Okay, so. <laughs> Next uh, section is the core of my presentation today. So labor market integration of migrants in Japan. So key questions. So Japan is an emerging destination for migrant workers in Asia and labor market integration is the most significant issue. However, the Japanese labor market is believed to be, believed to be close to migrant workers. For instance, Japan is not an attractive to highly skilled workers uh, by HSBC expert uh, Express survey before 2021. And uh, in many journalism and newspapers, technical intern and training programs, so TITP, it's condemned as human trafficking by the US government. So US by, uh, yeah, so US Department of State reports uh, in every year. And uh, migrant workers wage level is lower than the natives by 26%. So according to uh, the official statistics of wage structure in Japan and TATP workers are more than slaves. Sometimes uh, they are called yeah, more than slaves. And uh, in the backdrop of it, cultural homogeneity is assumed to be a root cause. Uh, but is this correct? It's my question. And so this my research question is, is the integration of migrant workers in Japan hindered by the cultural homogeneity of Japanese society? Which factors can explain the income gap and the occupational status gap between migrants and natives if it isn't? So my hypothesis is that a low international skill transferability causes the income gap between migrants and natives uh, which is generally low uh, in the Japanese employment system. Okay, so uh, first of all, what is the Japanese employment system? The Japanese employment system has uh, these four characteristics. So first is seniority-based promotion system and long-term or lifetime long employment and unclear job description and ramp recruitment from schools. So for instance, a person is supposed to be employed just after uh, how his graduation from an undergrad course or a high school, uh, work for the same company and be promoted to managers or a higher position until their retirement age. So retirement age is 65 years old. So as a result, the uh, Japanese employment system doesn't fit, uh, for instance, job hoppers uh, women uh, who uh, is uh, yeah uh, usually who usually have a, a kind of disruptive uh, careers, and migrants uh, of course are uh, they come from abroad uh, in mid career in the mid career, uh, so due to its under development of skill evaluation, so it's my hypothesis. And it's a, a picture uh, figure showing structure of Japanese employment system. So as I mentioned, main course is here, from ramp hiring of newly graduate students and uh, through internal labor market, you uh, can be promoted to managers. But only route uh, from external labor markets, there are two routes. One is for highly skilled professionals, 
but it's not uh, employ as the core members of the company. It's just like a kind of a, a temporary advisor helper uh, in terms of some skills. And another route is uh, low skill. So it's a kind of a bulb of labor force. So uh, students and housewives, elderly migrants are uh, playing this part to be able to play this part. Okay, and research design. Uh, so focusing on occupational status and the wage rate of migrants and natives. So data is population census of Japan. So micro data of population census of Japan in 2000 and 2010. And the methods is uh, estimate the skill transferability and adapt adaptation effect uh, of length of residency uh, depending on job types by multivariate analysis and focusing on uh, typical foreign workers in Japan, so Chinese and Brazilian men. So Chinese are a typical case of high skill uh, who mainly graduate from Japanese universities. And after graduation, they obtain a job in Japan. And as for uh, Japanese Brazilians, they are mainly Japanese Brazilians uh, coming to Japan as a uh, long-term resident. And they can work freely in Japan but uh, their uh, occupational status and wage levels are uh, quite low. Okay, this is a uh, graph. These are the graphs showing composition of uh, job of each uh, nationality. So Chinese people are mainly occupied by uh, uh, engineer and uh, uh, skilled labor. And uh, many of them are permanent residents uh, who are former high skilled people. And uh, as for Japanese Brazilian, many of them are permanent residents and long term residents. And spouse or child of Japanese nationals. Uh, this composition, uh, due to mainly uh, the fact that they are family migrants, uh, so Japanese descendants uh, return migrants to Japan. Okay, so it's a uh, graph showing uh, educational attainment of migrants and natives. And you can see that uh, Chinese people are more highly educated than Japanese males. And Brazilians are showing uh, average lower uh, educational attainment level compared to Japanese and Chinese men. And this table shows uh, labor market major labor market indicators of migrants natives. And you can see that there's uh, almost no gap uh, in terms of labor participation rate. And they show a slightly higher unemployment rate than Japanese men. And uh, in terms of professionals, uh, proportion professionals, uh, Ch Ch Chinese people, uh, show higher percentage of uh, professionals, proportional pro professionals than Japanese men, and Brazilians uh, show a very small proportion. And uh, proportional managers, so Chinese uh, smaller than that of Japanese, but higher than Brazilian. It's partly uh, a result of their gap uh, in their educational attainment. Okay, and the working hypothesis. So estimating skill transferability, working hypothesis A is uh, if skill transferability is 100%, then migrant workers are in the same level of occupation uh, based on their attributes, uh, such as educational attainment. And second, uh, skill transferability should differ depending on different treatment of the uh, occupation in the uh, Japanese employment system. For instance, high skill transferability among professionals but low ST among administrative staff. And the methods are uh, those. So comparing occupational attainment. So professional managers uh, between migrants with foreign education background and Japanese with the same attributes, mainly educated in Japan. And comparing skill transfer between professionals and managers. Okay, so this is a, a, a formula, but uh, yeah, I can skip it. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is a result. So this result shows the uh, estimated probability for attaining a professional occupation by educational attainment and by uh, countries of so 
citizenship, nationality. And you can see that uh, highly educated Chinese uh, men uh, showed a higher uh, percent, higher probability for attaining professional occupation. And this means their skill transferability. So they are uh, educated in China. So their skill transferability for uh, obtaining a professional job is higher than 100%. Uh, but uh, less of, uh, other than uh, high skilled Chinese men, many uh, skill transferability are hindered. So uh, even among Chinese people and Brazilians, uh, showed average a uh, lower uh, skill transferability than uh, Chinese. But on the other hand, estimated probability for attaining a managerial occupation, you can see that uh, all uh, so Chinese, Chinese and Brazilian uh, both showed uh, low skill transferability for attaining a managerial occupation. And, but only uh, job working experience in years, so working experience in uh, their country of origins, uh, Chinese people uh, showed uh, uh, statistic, statistic, statistically insignificant difference. So almost the same uh, value of working experience uh, in years in China uh, compared to Japanese men. But as for Japanese Brazilians, the working experience are uh, de-evaluated. So skill transferability from Brazil to Japan is uh, hinder. <clears throat> okay, so we can uh, say that our STs are, are hindered for migrants. However, depending on educational attainments and migrant country of origin and type of occupation. So STs uh, differ even among migrants, but a, a, a hypothesis that tries to explain it from the kind of xenophobic attitude of Japanese society cannot explain these differences. Okay, so next is how do they adapt to the Japanese labor market? A question on uh, immigrant economic assimilation. So working hypothesis uh, are uh, migrants climb up the career ladder along with uh, more extended residence in Japan. Their adaptation differs depending on their position in the Japanese employment system. So uh, high adaptation among professionals, low adaptation among administrative staff, staff, and more rapid catch up among migrants with low skill transferability than those with high uh, esteem. So kind of catch it up, we can, uh, we can uh, detect a uh, kind of catch up effect. And the methods is, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, is using pseudo cohort analysis. So I can show that uh, these figures. So I have, I use two uh, time point census data and uh, depending on the language of residency, I can uh, con constitute a kind of a pseudo cohort. So you can see this, these people will move to this part. Uh, in 10 years. So we can track the same and the same people uh, in between two time points. Okay, this is the formulas, but uh, we can skip and the uh, result is this. So this means a uh, uh, time difference between occupational status change between two time points. And as for uh, promotion for professionals, uh, we can see that positive figures uh, for almost all uh, cases. And, but on the other hand, uh, as for promotion for managerial position, we can only see very limited number of uh, positive figures. Okay, these graphs showed the relationship between skill transferability soon after the migration to Japan and the uh, long-term adapt adaptation effect uh, in 10, I, in 10 years. So you can see uh, the clear adverse relationship between STs and uh, uh, patient mobility uh, in 10 years among uh, professional people. So uh, mobility to professional, you can see it's a clear adverse relationship. So if you have uh, limited skill transferability, your catch up will be greater. But uh, as for managerial position, uh, we cannot see such a relationship. 
Okay, so adaptation effects are broadly seen among migrants regardless of uh, countries of origin and educational attainments. So even among Brazilians with only compulsory uh, education, we can see the uh, adaptation effect. But a uh, trade-off between high uh, skill transferabilities and low adaptation and vice versa, which results in almost zero for promotion to the managerial position. And third, migrants can be promoted in their positions in even, even in the Japanese employment system through an internal labor market, not the external one. So adaptation through an internal labor market is a case of Japanese uh, experience. Uh, it's a unique uh, finding, I think. And migrants are economically assimilated into the Japanese labor market, also their passport, it depends on the position in the Japanese employment system. Uh, this is quite important. Okay, so final section. So what does matter in integration of migrants in Japan? So uh, to sum up, uh, we uh, have, uh, yeah, we can say Asia is the most prominent hotspot of international migration globally. And Japan is an emerging destination for labor migrants, mainly for labor migrants in Asia. And of course, as a result, labor market integration is a crucial issue. Uh, but in the Japanese labor market, migrants are economically disadvantaged, mainly due to low skill transferabilities, except highly educated Chinese professionals. Adaptation effects through different paths uh, depending on their position in the Japanese employment system. So through an internal labor market to managerial positions uh, and external labor market to professionals. So there are uh, two routes uh, for migrants to be promoted in our Japanese employment system. <clears throat> and uh, the skill transferabilities and the labor market structure determine the socioeconomic status of migrants in Japan. Uh, and any cultural explanation cannot explain such diversities within the migrants. So, uh, of course, there are also xenophobic attitudes among Japanese. But uh, if you uh, omit the uh, aspect of skill transferabilities, you cannot explain well this uh, diversity within the migrants. Uh, cause, uh, because if uh, cultural attitudes can only explain the difference, so everybody is kind of discriminated uh, by the same degree. So uh, kind of the uh, fixed term of the explanation. But uh, we can explain more diversities uh, by, uh, yeah, in terms of uh, skill transferabilities and the Japanese employment system. Okay, and however, it is a standard approach uh, to migration studies. So. It's not a new in terms of migration studies globally, but uh, simple reductionism to discriminative uh, and xenophobic attitude can explain the reality. It's a kind of a, a consensus among migration researchers, but in the case of some uh, studies in uh, other in the countries other than the US, migration researchers tend to take such a kind of uh, uh, attitude. So yeah, so try to explain uh, it from the cultural perspective. Uh, so this is the case of Japan. And migration studies which have roots in the US can apply to other areas such as Asia and Japan. And recently uh, application to European countries are uh, successive, uh, successful. Uh, so I, think, I also think that uh, Asia and Japan uh, will be also the next case of application of migration studies yeah, in the US. And uh, my analysis can be the first step of the journey. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, and uh, finally, so just for your information, uh, today's lecture is uh, based on my uh, book. Uh, so we will be doing the things, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, I think I'll uh, Kind of one of the most comprehensive explanations of Ming society of Japan from the uh, quantitative perspective. Okay, that's it. Thank you.
Okay, Dr. Korekawa, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting, Heidi, uh, quantitative analysis, which is, as you said, it's a standard approach in the US and elsewhere, but it's still uh, new to Japan. Let us then have comments by Dr. Uh, Professor Yamaguchi, who is also a very specialist in this field. Professor Yamaguchi, please. Yes. I'd like to share the slide first. And, uh... So um, he has a very good overview of the history of the migrant issues and for Japan and global issues. And then he have a specific question about, uh, about the question, what does matter? And uh, the question, Korekawa implies that what matters is equality of opportunity implicitly for the status attainment between migrants and foreign workers and the Japanese workers. And to address this question, he analyzes uh, first skill transferability, which is measured actually the SES return to education. SES here it means professionals and managers. It's the same as foreign workers and compared with Japanese workers. Then by whether adaptation measured by the catching up of the migrants and foreign workers in skill transferability, which is initially low except for Chinese with college degree, with years of work experience in Japan, and conclude that adaptation measures by the attainment of professional occupation exists for foreign workers. However, adaptation measures by the attainment of managerial positions does not exist. So he concludes that the very general argument about the cultural barrier of the homogeneous country is proven and inadequate. So these findings are very, very interesting and informative, but I, 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 I raise some questions and, and uh, comments. So first, whether does the Japanese employment system matter? I mean, that's um, uh, at least for he, his, his finding that managerial positions, uh, distinction between managerial positions and uh, the professional position regarding the attainment of foreign workers, the managerial position, the standard career ladder position in, in the in the Japanese internal labor market, uh, which is called the Japanese employment system, uh, which is which is applicable to large and medium-sized Japanese firms for generalists. Whereas the professional position, not all of them, but many of them are largely staff positions for specialists, which are filled outside of the standard career ladders of the internal labor market. Hence, handicaps that immigrants and foreign workers have in attaining managerial position in Japanese firms still reflect a structural barrier embedded in the Japanese employment system. And also, Prakash's finding of adaptation may also reflect a cultural barrier in a very specific sense. Now, according to a recent study by Igarashi, uh, he, uh, oh, he, he also studies uh, uh, immigrants workers in Japan. Uh, Japanese people actually toward immigrants on survey respondents rating of a hypothetical applicants for immigration. Uh, based on so-called uh, 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 experimental audit method, which is sort of a variation of hypothetical uh, uh, applicants, uh, curriculum feeder, which also face race and age and uh, uh, occupational educational uh, background, indicates uh, who is more regarding who is more favorable to as immigrants, but evaluated by Japanese. What matters is most is the capability of Japanese language. So Japanese proficiency is by far the, the strongest criteria of favoring or disfavoring immigrants. Um, the second most important criterion, the type of professional occupation immigrants. So people with occupation, the higher SES are more favored. I have some reasons for this one later. And interestingly, race doesn't matter at all. Well, in fact, in slightly in favor of the blacks and the both distinction of black and whites and Asians. So, Korekawa's finding that more opportunity exists as years of employment increases, so adaptation hypothesis, um, may reflect the effect of acquisition of Japanese proficiency and a gradual removal of the major cultural barrier, namely the language handicap. Also consistent with sort of cultural uh, barrier issues, very specific sense. And this is just a graph, a figure uh, from the Igarashi study. This shows, uh, this shows on the left-hand side, Left is point three is a low favoring and point three is a high favoring and actually standardized to become I mean, the mean to have a point zero five, and you can see language skills is 
very, very vary depending on whether the language skills is proven, broken, uh, trying out, trying but cannot and cannot. Of course, this is a largest variation of favoring versus disfavoring certain uh, immigrants with certain attributes. And, and occupation or profession is the second critical factor. So uh, the next question is, are the findings generalizable? And uh, just I'll give you an example. One is, one is a split labor market for the Chinese in Japan, a later issue adaptation. Uh, according to one of the former students of mine, Gracia Fowler, who is uh, now a professor at Waseda University, uh, in her dissertation at the University of Chicago based on snowball sampling of interviews and interviews for legally and illegally staying Chinese, Chinese in Tokyo, she found that these two groups are almost segregated groups in terms of the occupation in Japan. The legal one is high SES and the, the illegal one that low SES and the education attainment. One group has college or more education versus the other has high school or less. And the, the regional rail origins in China, the big cities and, uh, for the illegally staying Chinese and uh, Fujian province or other poor provinces for other uh, illegally staying uh, Chinese. So, um, and interestingly, Japanese attitude toward Chinese people heavily depending on what occupation they have. And actually that's also largely reflects the distinction between the two groups. So those who are ex exposed to legally staying Chinese have more favorable opinions and those who are exposed to uh, uh, low skills or people of low skill occupation, which are mostly illegal Chinese are negative opinions. So the, the point is that uh, right, we, we don't have official statistics right now for how many of the foreign workers are Ill were, uh, illegal. The 99.5 estimate is 44%. It's, it should have declined because the number should, shouldn't have increased much well as uh, legally admitted workers increased, clearly increased. But anyway, no significant number of workers are illegal. And Korakawa's definition of adaptation based on skill transferability, and that is actually how much the return of higher education to SES uh, changes over time. This focuses only, well, implicitly on the adaptation of people with high skills. How much of the courage, credential for courage can be recovered with years of saying, but is the adaptation of foreign workers with low skills, high skills or less education, not necessarily those who are illegally staying, but also in general, also important. And that's somehow is missed uh, in this particular analysis of the promotion to profession, professional and managerial occupations. And human rights issues also exist for those uh, 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 legal work, uh, I mean, illegally staying and also TP, TITP trainees, which is being quite well known. And so that's an issue. And another issue of generalizability is whether a the uh, analysis of Chinese and the Brazilians represent the entire picture of the immigrant workers. And actually one point of emphasis is, is mine is gender ratio of the immigrants has very greatly. And I, you can see that top 15 or top 14 with 15 uh, ethnic groups, foreign workers groups and, and the size and the, uh, gender ratio. And certain countries, actually the China and Brazilians are quite gender mixed, well mixed uh, ethnic groups, but as certain other groups, uh, Filipino and uh, those from Philippine, Thailand, and Taiwan are heavily represented by women than men. And also, at least for the Philippine and Thailand, it's been well known that they, those women tend to have certain specific type of occupations, uh, care work and uh, so-called entertainment industry work. And uh, so, and they are sort of work life experiences of, oh sorry, not right, work experiences in Japan should be very different from uh, the women of other uh, ethnic groups. Uh, they are also sizable in numbers. And also uh, other, others, other uh, gender ratio types, Indonesia, India, and Sri Lanka. And also, I, it doesn't come to 14, but it's also uh, Bangladesh and uh, Pakistan also comes to this, the same, same group, but have very, large ratio of the men, overrepresented heavily by men than women. And their work is, they, they come not as a families and therefore, and also um, you know, 
they're not likely to marry, but as uh, uh, with, with the Japanese. Whereas actually, those, those who have high female ratio, the Philippines and Thailand, have very high marriage rate with the Japanese. But uh, those who from Southeast Asia are staying single largely, and therefore the gender ratio is still predominantly male. And their work experiences in Japan should be very different from those of the Chinese and Brazilians. And more general issues. So a female falling workers, whether falling female workers are doubly handicapped, but being a woman and being a minority ethnic group in Japan. So in order to, in order to assess that, we, we need to know, uh, first of all, what is the sort of nature of the gender inequality in employment in Japan among, among the Japanese? Uh, in my, my study actually showed that there are three major causes uh, of uh, gender inequality in the labor market and employment. First, women are seriously overrepresented in irregular, irregular work, which is called hiseiki employment. More for 50% for women and about 20% for men. The irregular workers have uniformly, nearly uniformly low wages with no return to tenure, uh, sizable, significant return to tenure. Whereas for the regular workers, the years of experience as to their increase in the salaries. Even among regular employed, second, even among regularly employed workers, say Koyosha, women are seriously underrepresented in managerial positions, controlling for education, payment, and age, and years of employment with a firm. Third, women are nearly excluded from high SES professional occupations. The female in college uh, ratio in college educators, physicians, lawyers, congresspersons, high school principals is either the lowest or the second lowest next to South Korea among OECD countries. So these are the three major causes of uh, uh, in gender inequality in Japan for the labor market and employment. Regarding foreign workers, it seems, my, this is my guess, but a uh, uh, sort of informed guess, uh, the for, female foreign workers now seem to be doubly handicapped uh, fem, in one and two, because male workers are also handicapped. Actually, for those who are employable as say shining or regular workers is actually 25.3%. So men as well as women foreign workers cannot attain sort of uh, uh, say shining status and therefore they should be the, both equally, almost equally handicapped. And Kolekawa's study also says men, uh, foreign workers are handicapped for attainment of managerial positions and, and therefore one and two, they, are, they may not be, uh, they will, it is not it's likely, it is likely that they are not doubly handicapped, but female foreign workers seem to be doubly handicapped, especially the Japan's, uh, even though Kurekawa analyzed the attainment of professional positions, professional positions works are very heterogeneous in terms of wages, and women are concentrated on low wage professionals, and, um, and that seems to be applicable to also uh, Women of the foreign, foreign or foreign female foreign workers, and therefore they are doubly. It seems to that doubly handicapped in that respect. And other studies, uh, which is uh, unfortunately the job only available in Japanese, is uh, according to the study of Nakamura at all, the economist. Uh, this shows, interestingly, the increasing number of foreign workers in Japan unexpectedly raised, rather than lowered the average wage of Japanese workers. Even though that they, they, uh, it is assumed that com increased competition will actually lead uh, or increase supply of the labor will lower Japanese workers' wages, especially for uh, high school workers. It's contrary to expectation, opposite. But one of the causes is that uh, they identified as a crowding out, a demand shift to employer as a result of supply change. Hmm. If Japanese high school graduates average wage increase as a result, who are those out uh, left the labor market must be Japanese with high school graduates with relatively low wages, and they are largely irregular workers overrepresented by women. Hence, increase in unskilled foreign workers, mostly Japanese Latin Americans, those from, from Brazil and Peru, and TITP trainees may have aggravated employment opportunity for high school graduates especially among women. This is also reflect the vulnerability of regular employment in Japanese labor market, which is sort of culturally embedded the structural constraints um, on, on Japan. C 
seems to uh, assume implicitly that an important criterion in foreign workers integration in Japan is the equality of opportunity with the Japanese. It is important aspect, an important aspect, but there is another aspect for regarding integration. A uh, recent study by Yang um, uh, shows that job satisfaction of migrant workers depends on their outside alternatives or reference groups. And he found that workers with high education uh, and high more dissatisfied rather than satisfied because they compare their uh, situation with those of higher wages elsewhere, such as Singapore and Hong Kong. Highly skilled professional workers um, and well, IT area especially is much higher now in the, uh, for Singapore or Hong Kong compared with Japan. And there are sort of uh, even the Japanese brain drain issues exist for uh, people who have highly uh, professional in technical areas. And on the other hand, low education and low wages are more satisfied because they compare their situation with those of similar others in their home countries. So whether the Japanese workers are the real reference group for their satisfaction or integration may be questionable because their reference groups are different. So I have uh, three suggestions for further analysis based on extension of the employee statistical models. Um, it seems to be important to analyze skill transferability and adaptation separately for men and women. And also it seems to be important for generalizability to prize the model to groups for which gender ratio greatly differs from the Chinese and Brazilian, such as group of Philippine and Thai people and group of people from South Asian countries. Third, even though the current analysis focus on uh, attainment of the professional occupation and managerial occupation, it is highly, first of all, it is highly recommended to extend this analysis to uh, by wage or income as a dependent variable, and then focus on whether the negative effects of ethnicity on wage earning decrease with years among those with high school education or less as a measure of adaptation of people with low skills to transfer. Because right now it seems, as I mentioned early, that adaptation measure seems to focus on whether those who are relatively highly educated and therefore should have high return to uh, state, CES return to high education will be attained. And he found that at least for professional occupation, it is it, it holds. It doesn't hold for administrative occupation, but it's left out whether the adaptation issues of the low skilled uh, people, which is also a, a no, it's quite quite sizable in Japan, and actually is uh, one of the two big big groups. And that's that's all for my comments. Okay. So I stop sharing. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Yamaguchi. Uh, there are so many very dense substantive comments, which. Uh, probably requires uh, Dr. Korekawa to respond another half an hour. <laughs> so he doesn't have enough time to respond. Finishing the presentation in time, it's uh, 6.30. So uh, Dr. Korekawa, thank you very much for presenting the wonderful, uh, interesting uh, studies of Japanese immigration issues in the labor market. And Professor Kazuo Yamaguchi, thank you for your very rich comment on to uh, Prof Dr. Korekawa's presentation. And for the audience, thank you very much for attending uh, this uh, presentation, uh, as well as uh, submitting the very interesting questions. And again, uh, this presentation and a seminar seems to be very, very rewarding. Thank you very much. See you again in the next so immigration seminar.